So let's start with um, the equation for a really simple state space model. This is a univariate linear state space model. And the structure of these models is we have something called a state. And then we have, that's going to be our x. We're always going to use um, uh, x's for states. This is a hidden state. So a state space model has a hidden part. This is hidden. And you'll see what I mean by hidden in a moment. And then we have our observation part of the equation. We're always going to call that y. So you have this hidden part. And then you have an observation of the hidden part. There's the hidden part. And in this example of a univariate state space model, it is just that hidden part plus some error. So really, really, really simple. It's about as simple as you can get. So this model, in this model, our hidden part, the x part, the state, is a classic random walk with drift. That's all that is here. Here's our x. It's a function of x t minus 1. There's our u. It's drift. And then we have white noise. That's what's hidden. And we are observing that with this observation uh, part. So that looks really simple. That is the simplest version of this state space model or formulation. And this is a really huge area within state space models. And for the kinds of data that we work with, it's really powerful because our questions in uh, fisheries and ecology and in, in, looking at inf environmental data often are almost, uh, I'd say almost, almost, I guess it depends what you're looking at, but it's very, very common that this kind of structure is how we think about our data. So we think that we are taking some observations of some underlying stochastic process that is hidden to us. And our data are just measuring imperfectly that hidden process. The classic form of these state space models is a model where you have a, it's a lag one. So um, it, do, it wouldn't have to be. So you could have longer labs, but it's, it's really common, really, really common to just in these models have a lag one. So that means that um, the, uh, for your state, it's the value at time t is a function of t minus one. You might see this written as t plus one is a function of t, it's still lag one. If you put a, a parameter in front of there, it's still lab one. So why is that super simple model so important in the analysis of um, ecological fisheries, environmental data? Well, random walks come up in all kinds of things that we study. So um, if you're thinking about movement data, so if you had tag data, that's just naturally a random walk. So you have your, um, uh, your, your fish, say, that has a tag on it, and it would tend to go in one direction. But because of the environment, there's some error there. So it would tend to go like in that direction. But by chance, it might go a little, you know, a little bit different direction. And then the next time, it's going to start wherever it was, it is. And it's going to tend to go in one direction, but there may be some error. That's a random walk. Uh, gene frequency, it's another example. Somatic growth, that's another example of a ra random walk. So these random walks happen where anytime you have 
the value now is going to determine what happens in the next time step, but there's, then there's going to be some error. Um, Gaussian is also a very common distribution that's used. And there are many situations where we won't want to use Gaussian, but um, Gaussian actually comes up in data, appears in data a lot. And that's because if we um, average a lot of small perturbations, that distribution will be a Gaussian. So there's a lot, a lot of situations where whatever is causing things to fluctuate, it's actually being pinged from a lot of different um, uh, sort of a different direction. So like it's being affected by, you know, the temperature, it's salinity, uh, the tide, there's all these different things having an impact on it. And so that it ends up being the average of a lot of small perturbations and averages of stochastic processes will um, be Gaussian. So I, that's why you can think of that being very common. It's also nice. It's really easy to work with. We also, in our field, will um, often come across multiplicative random walks. And if we have a multiplicative random walk, when we take the log of that data, it becomes an additive random walk. So what's a classical example of that? Population growth. Um, so population growth, you can um, think of like this say the population size at time t is whatever the population size was at the previous time step times the growth rate. So it's times the growth rate there. So let's say the, um, if the growth rate is say 10%, goes up 10% per year. So that would be 1.1 times whatever the population size was. So that's a multiplicative process take the log of that, that becomes additive. And this is why we often will be taking the log of count data. If it's a population count data, really common, we're going to take the log of that so that we can create an additive random walk process. But we wouldn't do that to movement data because movement data um, already starts out as an additive random walk process. Um, somatic growth is um, sometimes modeled, you know, sometimes often can be modeled as a multiplicative process too. So there are times too when you would, um, if you're looking at somatic growth, where you'd be taking logs. All right. So um, the Gompertz model is a model that comes up in our field a lot too. Um, and that is, I'm going to do uh, start with this form here. So if you look at this equation here, that should be a familiar now. That is an AR1 process. And if this B, the absolute value of that is between, or is less than one, that's going to be a stationary process. So it's just going to have a, you know, be fluctuating around some line. And that is related to this density dependent process. So this is in the non log space. So if we thought of this as a population process, if n is the population size, if we model the growth here. Um, here's our growth rate, and then we had density dependent as this exponent on our population size. If we so that's a density dependent model. If you were to simulate that, you would see it goes to some quote unquote carrying capacity. It goes to some level. It doesn't. It's not like exponential growth. It goes up forever. Ever. If we take the log of that data, we get this AR1 process. If we take a log of that, you can see that it looks kind of like um, 
a density dependent population process that you might see in, in a textbook, say. So this would be weak density dependence. So it is fluctuating about some level, but it might go up or down quite a bit. These are all simulated from the same equation, same Gompertz equation. Um, you can see it's quite flexible. It can produce a lot of different trajectories. That's just, just by chance. And then as we decrease that B term, which in this context of a Gompertz density dependence model would be the strength of density dependence, you can see it, it becomes uh, quite a bit tighter. So, um, so the population examples, that's just to give you some concrete examples of how we use the random walk models, but we're going to be using random walks to model all kinds of different trends in real data. And this random walk model is very, very flexible. This is going to be able to model all kinds of trends in our data. And here's an example where I have taken this model here, simple random walk with drift, and I have um, an error term that's just white noise. So this is just exit time t is exit time t minus one plus a negative 0.02, it's a slightly declining, and then some normal error with pretty low variance. And you can see very, very flexible it's going to be able to model all kinds of strange wiggles in our data. It's going to be really nice. Okay. Any um, questions, confusions so far? We're going to see lots more examples as I go along, solidify this. Okay. So, um, just to reiterate the jargon here, you're going to hear this a lot over the next um, few weeks. In the context of a state space model, state is referring to the hidden part. That means you're not directly observing that. Your data are not a true, a true value of that hidden state. It's a um, a view of that hidden state with some error. So the state is hidden, it's dynamical, it's stochastic. Our data are observations of that hidden part. So this is the one that we're doing, state observation. I'm writing here the simplest possible uh, state space model, just so you can start getting your hands on the structure of this. On Thursday, we're going to leave that, uh, leave this simple form uh, behind, and we're going to just jump right in to multivariate versions of this. And, and you'll see how you can model very complicated multivariate data using this framework. But let's keep it simple right now and let's show an example with some population count data. So these are data of African wild dogs, uh, critically endangered uh, species. And these are uh, data starting from the early 1970s going into the early 1990s. And population biologists wanted to use these data to make some predictions about what was going to happen to the population. And specifically, how long was it, would it take until this population was expected to be extinct? So first, you need to think about, OK, so what, what do these data represent? So the. Um, thinking is that, well, these are counts, but we could be missing some dogs, given the way that the, the count is. These aren't the total number of wild, uh, African wild dogs, it's an estimate. So there's some true value of what the population size is 
And then these counts are an estimate of that truth. So there's some, something hidden. And the hidden part is the population size. And the data are our estimates of that. So this is a classic state space framework. The way that I've just described it is a state space. So I've got this hidden state and then I have observations of this hidden state. And what I care about in order to model this is I care about that blue line. So this, um, this I think kind of gets at a little why that say the ARIMA approach um, doesn't uh, show up so uh, all that much really as you as you know Eric and uh, Mark and myself you know indicated you know we don't review papers that use ARIMA models so much and and this kind of shows an example because what we care about in this example is that blue line we're not actually trying to model the the dots here what we care about is the part that we don't know we want to know the dynamics of that blue part because we want to forecast that Okay, so it, our goal is to estimate that blue part. And if we were to take an ARIMA part, it's not gonna get us that blue line. But a state space approach <coughs> will get us an estimate of that blue line. So um, in, uh, in our field, you know, when we're working with environmental data, fisheries data, you know, population data, Observation error is a huge, huge issue. And I, I, I like to put this picture up. So this is um, a data set that I worked on for many, many years. And this was the real survey data at that time for stellar sea lions in the Gulf of Alaska. So those dots there are sea lions. And that, that's the reality, that, that's where that census data came from. So you can see there, yeah, yeah, there, there's a lot of observation error there. And something that's really interesting for us is that that observation error variance is often unknown. If you were to talk with somebody who's working in an experimental setting, um, or say they're working on uh, like, uh, you know, sensors or something, they could do something and they could estimate what the variance is, the observation error. You know, they could rerun their experiment multiple times, but that's often, it's very unusual that we'd be able to do that. Usually we have some data and we're going to have to estimate what that observation error is within our data. <clears throat> Okay, so let's see. Oh, I'm doing here. Okay, a few more minutes. Okay, so um, within these state space models, uh, let's go back here. Okay, so let's look at this. Um, another, some more uh, jargon that you'll need to um, familiarize yourself with. So within these state space models, there's something called process error and non process error. The process error is this part is that time step to time step um, variability in the hidden state. And the observation error is this part. It is the error between our observation and that hidden state. So let's see this graphically. So um, suppose we have these data and it's some population estimate, let's say population density, say. Yeah, okay. So if I were to think about the hidden state as a straight line, so that would be a little linear regression actually, then in that case, there's no process error because I, I said there is none, it's just zero, it's just a straight line. And then the, uh, all the error in the data would be not processed. And so this difference between this blue line and my data would be the non-process error. So that's, if you're doing a linear, linear regression, 
you don't have process error. That doesn't appear in those type of models. This is this process error happens in these state space models where the hidden state is stochastic. It's varying time step to time step. Okay, let's jump here. I wanna jump right over here to the state space model. So in the state space model, we've got that blue line and we have observations of that blue line. The non-process variability is going to be the difference between the blue line and the data, the axis. And the process part is the variability of the blue line here. So um, for this blue line, let's say it's a random walk with drift. Based on this data point right here, I could predict that, um, let's say, you know, I'm predicting it's going up 2% per year. I predict that next year it's going to be here, but in actuality, it was a bit lower than that. And that uh, how much it is below what I would predict is the process variability. That's that little W term in the equation. All right, let's see. We are now at 250. So that's good. Uh, I'm going to stop there and I will pick up and finish this off uh, on Thursday. So uh, from last Tuesday, a univariate state space model is a model that has an observation process and it has a a uh, hidden uh, state process. And here's an example with um, some count data. And so this would be our example where these are the, the data and these data are observations of this hidden process. And um, in my example, I was using it as a population process, but it could be any process that you're, you're observing. So the data themselves are not the true population size. The truth is this blue line. And we're trying to estimate what that blue line is because we want to understand how the population size is varying in time and how it might be affected by covariates in the environment, for example. So let's see one type of example. There's a uh, chapter on this in the uh, user guide that is linked on the, um, on the lecture page. So we're gonna look at some wild dog data and think about how we might model that data. So these, these are some actual count data from wild dogs in Africa. And let's imagine that you were tasked with estimating the probability that this wild dog uh, population, which was critically endangered, would go extinct within certain time frames. So a really standard uh, type of analysis that um, a, you know, a population modeler might be tasked with. So how are you going to approach this? Well, the general approach that you um, would take is you're going to fit some model, then you're going to simulate with that many times, and you're going to count how often your simulated trajectories hit some threshold. In this case, I'm looking at extinction, so I'd say like n equals one, say. So. The question is, well, what, what model are we going to use? Um, and, and I don't need, mean like, you know, really like the nitty gritty details about say like error, you know, what, what uh, error distribution are we going to use? I mean, really fundamental questions about how are we going to think about this data? And the uh, two um, or the three plots I show here are some of the standard ways that people have thought about uh, modeling and then simulating the projecting forward population count data. So one approach is the middle approach 
which is that, well, let's just figure out the trend. And then that trend, we, you know, um, forecast forward that linear trend. And that, that's basically our forecast of what happens. We may have some uncertainty about what that linear trend is, but we're not um, assuming that this underlying population process is varying. Okay, so uh, population modelers um, uh, hopefully obviously had problems with thinking about it that way because that fundamentally doesn't model the population as the stochastic process. And by that, I mean that, you know, like some years they might be good and the population size would go up and then some years might be bad and the population size would go down. So, so this approach is, is not thinking of the population as this stochastic trajectory. So another approach that was taken um, for a long time was to think of the count data as a random walk. So, um, so that fits in with this idea of like, you have this um, exponential growth, say. Um, th these ideas were for populations that were very small, declining. And they, it was felt that density dependence wasn't really affecting them. So it was felt like a, or an exponential growth. In, in this case, exponential decline model would work. And now we're going to fit that model. And the problem with the classical approaches was that we would treat the counts that we are measuring as the true population size. So that, that was our estimate of the true population size. And the problem with that is people uh, pointed out that that is going to really overestimate the year-to-year -year variability in the uh, population growth or decline. And that's going to affect our forecast. So a more recent, uh, well, it's been around since the 1990s. Um, so it's not that uh, recent. Um, so a different approach is to say, OK, now let's treat the counts as having observation error. And there's this hidden population process. And we're going to try to estimate what that hidden population process is. And those different approaches to how we think about the data, how we forecast the data, have very large consequences on what we would report as the probability of extinction. So uh, if we were to treat the data, the count data, as the true population size, there's no observation error in that, then, so here's our, our data. We're going to treat that as the truth. If we were to estimate a model from that, a random walk model from that, and forecast forward, lots of variability here. So the probability of hitting, you know, this... Uh, count of one in one is going to be a lot larger because our forecast is just so large, so much variability there. Um, if we treat it as just a, a straight line and our only uncertainty uh, comes from uh, being uncertain about where we should put that line, then we're going to be um, much more certain we're going to report a high level of certainty about when the extinction occurs versus this. This is what we're going to say here. We're really uncertain. Um, and we could, it could happen really early. This one, we're going to be really certain when it happens. And we're going to say uh, it's not very likely to happen really early. The model where we have both of them is intermediate there. OK. All right, so now I want to show these um, this uh, univariate state space model using the idea of level and how we model the level in the data. Um, there's a couple. There's no. There's one chapter on this in the lab on the univariate state space models in the lab uh, manual, and it's going to use the Nile River 
data as an example. And I'm going to show a few slides from that. OK, so let's think about um, now just so we have some we have some data. So yeah, I think I've got the here we go. So these black lines here. OK, this happens to be the Nile River from 1870 to 1970. And they had some flow volume data. And it's that black line there. OK, so that's our data. So that's our Y. And how might we model that flow data? So we can think of that uh, flow data, that's the Y, as reflecting some level plus some error. A flat level model would just say we put a flat line through that. So our X is just a flat level. And our observation is of that flat level with error. A linear level model would say that that level changes through time, but it's just a linear line. So we have some, this would be our intercept, and this would be how it's going up with time. And our model now would look like this. We say that we have y is observing this level plus error. And then the last one is what's called the stochastic level model. And in this one, it's sort of the, it looks a lot like this. We have an observation and we have, we're observing the level that is changing through time. But in this case, it's a stochastic level. And we're modeling it, um, as I've written here, we're modeling it just as a random walk. But the more general idea is that it is some level that is a stochastic process. So let's see pictures of this. So just focus on the top three here. So we have, this is our flat level. This is the linear. And this is the stochastic level. So there's really important thing to um, kind of wrap your head around when you're thinking about this stochastic level model is that our estimate of that underlying level is stochastic. So you notice that these two don't have these uh, dotted lines. And these dotted lines are the, um, it's, it's a measure of the, the kind of the uncertainty of what the stochastic level is at. So let me walk through this. So in this flat level model, if I were to tell you If I were to tell you what u is, okay, I'm going to tell you that's what the parameter is, then you have no uncertainty about what that level is. It's just, it's just right there. That's how you're modeling it. With the linear uh, model here, if I were to tell you what that intercept and slope was, then that level is just that. It's just that, that red line. So with the parameters fixed, there's no uncertainty about what that red line is. With a stochastic level model, this is a sort of this is general for like a state space model, that underlying state, in this case, the underlying uh, level is a stochastic process. So here, if I tell you what that is, and I tell you what that variance is, so there's no uncertainty about the parameters there is still uncertainty about where this is because that equation that I just showed you, that random walk equation is a stochastic process. I can compute what the expected value of that state is, but that's just the expected value. That's like the mean value. And there will be some uncertainty about where that uh, process really is. So that's a really fundamental difference when we're uh, talking about state space models. So when we present what the estimate of the hidden state is, we're presenting the mean value or the expected value of that hidden state. And then we'll show the range that that hidden state could take. Okay. So 
when you uh, are working with state space models, you're going to hear um, the term Kalman filter and Kalman smoother. I'm not going to go into the math of those, but I want you to know basically what they are doing. And the Kalman filter is an algorithm for computing the expected value of the hidden state. So if I give you this model here that looks like this and looks like this, uh, the Kalman filter is specifically for state space models of this form. It doesn't mean any old state space model. It means this one. This is the univariate form. The Kalman filter is actually for the multivariate form you're going to see in a moment. But if I give you an equation like that, the Kalman filter will tell you the expected value of that hidden state. I have to give you the parameters too. If I give you the parameters, then I can compute the expected value. What the filter does is it computes that expected value given the data either up to time t or one step behind. So the data up to t minus one. That's what the filter does. What the smoother does is it computes the expected value of the state given all the data, both the future data and the past data. Which one of those you use depends on your objective. We, um, for most of the examples you're going to see, we're going to use the smoother. We're trying to use all the information that we have to estimate what the value of the hidden state is. Okay. Diagnostics for state space models are going to use something called the innovation residuals. So um, there's a lot of different residuals that you can compute with these state space models. Um, we're not going to go into that. You just need to focus on the um, the one that's called the innovations residuals or the one step ahead residuals. It's the one that's typically output by any residuals function. And what that is, is the expected value of the data. Let's go back here. It's the expected value of the data at time t minus what you would expect given the data up to time t minus one. So that's why it's called these one step ahead residuals. So you use the data up to t minus one, you forecast what the data are going to be at time t, and then you subtract what the data actually were at time t minus that expected value. And you're just going to do standard um, diagnostics. OK, in this class, we are for the this week and the next next week, we are going to be using the Mars package, which allows you to fit state space models. Uh, later on in the course, we're going to start working with state space models that are not Gaussian or maybe nonlinear, and um, we'll we'll move into other packages and, and using Bayesian models. But to start with, we're going to be using this Mars package. And this package lets you fit models that take this form right here. So that hopefully looks familiar now. You've got your x t, t minus 1, got a u, and then you have your errors. And we specify that the errors have a certain variance here. And we're going to be focusing on the parts that are large uh, bolded letters. So you might want to estimate this, this, or this. So there's basically six things that we're going to be focusing on estimating. You're going to do this in a moment. You'll see how it works. It's pretty straightforward. In this function, the main, uh, in this package, the main function is Mars. And the basic form is data. And then you're going to give it a model list. And in that model list, you're going to tell it what your equation looks like. Okay, so let's see an example. 
So the, the key thing is that model list. You got to figure out how to how to tell the function what your state space model looks like. So the um, the function wants to know what these six parameter matrices look like. That's what it's asking, what it needs to know. So let's see this univariate example. And the strategy that you're going to take when you're setting this up is you just need to go through one by one and figure out what they look like. So let's look at the B. What does the B look like in our univariate example? So that would be a one by one matrix. Mars always wants matrices. Okay. So we just say in our model list, B equals matrix one. Great. Okay, what's our U? Okay, this is something we're estimating. So we're, if it's something we're estimating, we put it in quotes as a character. So we say U equals matrix U. Notice it's looking just like our equation. It's set up that way. And now our Q, here's our Q, what is that? Oh, well, that's uh, also a one by one matrix. So we're just gonna say Q is matrix Q. Our Z, what is our Z? Well, it's not there, it's just a one. So it's a one by one matrix, so matrix one. Uh, a, oh, hey, there is no A, okay, then it's zero. Um, again, we have to tell it it's a matrix, so it's a matrix zero. And lastly is our R. And again, it's one by one, so we just say matrix R. So how that's the format of, for the next like, four lectures. When you're setting up uh, to fit an equation like this, you're just going to go through it, like through each one, and then specify in a list the structure. All right, so let's see some examples. So now is the, uh, we're going to do breakout rooms, but I'm going to start you off so you can see what it looks like. And then each breakout room will have a task to um, uh, run a Mars model on some univariate data. So let's see here. Okay. So once you open that up, you'll see this code here. You may need to install the color space library. I discovered that when I was running this code that um, there was uh, some palettes that weren't defined. So go ahead and install that if you need to. You might already have it because it may come with the forecast package. So we're going to go ahead and run that. And we're going to be playing around with the Nile data. The Nile data is comes with base R. So if you do plot Nile, you're going to see this over here, which is that Nile flow data. Okay. So now what we want to do is we want to fit that stochastic level model. So that's it, this right here. The yt is equal to this level here. And then we define the level as a random walk with drift. This is how you specify that model list. This is what I was just showing you in the slides. And this would be how you fit it. So you just run that. Doot, doot, doot. It's going to take a moment. There we go. So it fit. Okay. And our estimate R. Um, this U negative means it's generally going down, which it was. You can see it was generally going down here. We can plot this. Okay, so the output from Mars, the state states are in the states element from a fit. So if I do, let's go here, if I do a 
And so I put fit states. You're going to see that it is a matrix time going across the columns. And in this case, it's univariate. So I just have one row. So those are my estimated states. And this is from the Coleman smoother. So this is our estimate, the expected value of the state given all the data. If I plot that, so you see there, that red line is the expected value of the states. And I can do a, a forecast. Let's see. So then you can see here is my uh, forecast. So it's using the information about this estimated uh, level, this stochastic level here, and then also um, the observation error variance. All right. So what we're going to do, or what you're going to do, is we'll break up into three groups, three breakout groups. And so your objective is to uh, do one of these questions. So this is breakout group one. So for breakout group one, you need to change the state model to this. So you're going to have to look, um, you know, talk with each other about how, how is that different from that? And what do I need to change? I'll give you a hint. All of these are just changing one thing. And so uh, how do I change it to how do I change the model list to get that? And then we'll come back together and um, you can uh, describe what you had to do. OK. So let's, uh, I'm going to do it again. And uh, let's see our breakout groups here. So it'll be random again. OK, three of them. And I'm just going to give you 15 minutes on this task. OK. So group one is question one. And this one is question two. Okay, and I'm going to have Mark, Eric, and I um, in, uh, in different groups so that if you get stuck, you can um, <coughs> ask us. Eli, uh, Eli I, I have to, I have to um, leave at about uh, 2.25 for a meeting at 2.30. Okay, well, you'll be in uh, group three, so uh, this is only 15 minutes. You know, okay. I'll I'll uh, I'll drop in on group three also, uh, but I'll normally be staying in group uh, two. Okay, in question two. Okay, here we go. All right. So the first one. So this is our stochastic level, and here's our forecast. So notice here that. Um, the forecast, the, uh, the prediction intervals are growing through time. It's this, they're getting larger. Where is that coming from? That's coming from the random walk that we included in our model. Remember we showed you that uh, in a random walk, the uh, trajectories, the variance of the trajectories keeps growing through time. And that's what we're seeing here. Okay, so question one was, change the state model to this right here. So if you compare up to here, what have I changed? Well, I've gotten rid of the WT. I got rid of the error part. So now it's not a stochastic process. Now it's just, um, it's just gonna be a level here. 
So how do I change that? Well, all I need to do is set uh, Q equal to zero. So let's do that. There we go. So now that state is not a wiggly line, it's just a straight line. And notice, now that I got rid of that random walk in the underlying state, my prediction intervals, the variance, is not increasing through time. So very different when I think of my data like that with this straight line versus if I think of that underlying state as a random walk. Okay, what about question two? So question two, um, I got rid of the U. So I'm gonna put the, the process error back in there. So it's a stochastic process, but I got rid of the U. So when I go here, what does that mean? Is I set that U equal to zero. Uh, make sure I get that Q back in there. All right, so now, now it's got that random walk back in there. So my uncertainty is increasing through time. But look at that, look at this. This expected value is flat. Versus if I put that U in there, it's gonna estimate a trend. So in that case, see, it's estimating that it's downward. So that's that's a difference there. So that's you're showing you the difference with a random walk with drift, that's with a trend, versus a random walk without drift. And the last question was, um, what if I change the XT model and I get rid of the XT minus one? So now, it's not a random walk anymore. Now my hidden level is just a flat level with some error around it. How do we do that? Well, we got the U in there. We don't want to have the Q in there. We need to set the B equal to zero to get that XT minus one out of there. So we set that equal to zero. All right. And you see, again, those prediction errors, uh, sorry, yeah, the prediction errors are flat. We got rid of that underlying random walk by getting rid of the T minus one in this process. <laughs>